Welcome to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. Discover the best tips, tricks, and travel hacks for your visit to the nation's capital. And now, here's Rob. Hello, and thank you for tuning in. If you want to check out any show notes from this episode, listen to other episodes, or learn about Trip Hacks DC guided tours, you can do all of that over at TripHacksDC.com. If you're new to this podcast, or Trip Hacks DC in general, hello, my name is Rob. I'm a tour guide, and I founded Trip Hacks DC back in 2017. My goal is to give you my best tips, tricks, and travel hacks so you can have the best possible trip when you visit Washington, D.C. It's spring here in Washington, D.C. The cherry blossoms have bloomed. School groups are back. And the Washington Nationals have been playing for about one month. So I figured, what better time now than to make an episode about pro sports? Now, if you're not a sports fan, before you tune out or switch to another episode, I want to make the case for why you should listen to this episode and consider attending a pro game when you visit D.C. Even if you're not a fan of our local teams, or even if you don't consider yourself a fan of pro sports generally, it can still be a great time and one of the best memories from your trip. I have often said that when it comes to itinerary building, The best itineraries are a balance between touristy things and non-touristy things, between the federal government sites and the local things to do. Whenever someone asks me for suggestions about, quote, non-touristy things to do, pro sports is always one of my first answers. This is true in just about any city, not just D.C. If you want to rub elbows with locals and see how they actually spend their time, check out one of the pro teams if you can. Specific to D.C., though, is the reality that we have an overwhelming number of things for tourists to do during the day, but not a lot of tourist sites after 5 p.m., as the number of evening activities, especially evening activities that you can do with kids or teens, is somewhat limited. Pro sports can help fill that gap a bit. Another motivation I have for recording this episode is that pro sports is one of the more commonly requested video topics that I get for the Trip Hacks DC YouTube channel. Unfortunately, my attempts to post sports videos in the past have been, let's say, underwhelming. The YouTube algorithm is mysterious and frustrating, and whenever I've made sports videos, they just don't get pushed out. So I figured a podcast episode was a much better choice since I don't need to worry about algorithms or optimizations or anything like that over here. Personally, I will say that in my own travels, attending pro sports have been some of the best memories, but also some of the worst memories. Just last year, I took two trips. I went to New York City over Labor Day and saw some tennis matches at the U.S. Open. It was amazing. One of my best travel memories of the year. I also went to a major soccer game in another country. I'm not going to put them on blast because that's not my style, but I will say that it was a terrible experience and one of my worst travel memories of the year. It actually makes me really sad because I was looking forward to it, and it turned out to be a huge bust. A big part of the problem was that I was just woefully unprepared for what I was getting myself into. Soccer in the United States is culturally very different than in other countries, and in this case, it really felt like they were not friendly to casual fans. Like, if you weren't there to go hard for the local team, you weren't welcome. I wish I had known that in advance, and to some extent, that's on me. But I don't want anyone who comes to D.C. to have a similar negative experience. So I want to put as much information out there so that you can go into a game prepared and know exactly what to expect. So the way I'm going to organize this is that I'm going to talk through the pro sports options by sport. First, starting with the big five, baseball, basketball, football, hockey, and soccer. Then I'll talk about some pro sports leagues outside of the big five. And at the end, I'll talk about what college sports is like here and give some other general tips for attending a game or match. I'm also going to give you some somewhat basic information about each of our pro teams, the stadium or arena where they play, transportation options for getting there, and any relevant information I think you need to know, like the bag policy and outside food policy, plus any of my own personal tips for attending a game. Let's start with baseball. Selfishly, I want to start with baseball because it's my favorite pro sport to attend. 
but I also want to start with baseball because I consider it the most tourist-friendly sport. The Major League Baseball season overlaps with peak tourism season here in the summer, and there are the most number of games, 81 regular season home games over the course of that season. That means it is the most likely sport to have a home game happening while you're here, assuming you don't pick travel dates specifically to attend a game. Our MLB team is the Washington Nationals. They've been here almost 20 years, since 2005, when the Montreal Expos moved and changed their name to the Nationals. They most recently won the World Series in 2019, a glorious playoff run and one of the most exciting months for me as a fan that I've ever experienced. They play at Nationals Park, which has been open for about 15 years. I personally think it's a great place to watch a game, even though it rarely rises to the top of those best ballpark lists you see online, because it's really not iconic like some other MLB stadiums are. Nationals games are generally family-friendly, though it's worth saying that Sunday games are the most explicitly marketed as for kids. They often have special giveaways and promotions on Sundays for kids. For example, after the game, they let the kids under a certain age onto the field to run around the bases. So if that's important, I think it's worth knowing. The nature of baseball is that, since there are so many games throughout the season, no individual game during the regular season is going to make or break a team. So the games themselves tend to be fairly chill and relatively relaxed. If you're a fan of the opposing team, you can go to a Nationals game, and unless you're being an obnoxious or a jerk, you won't be given any grief. If you're not really a fan of either team, that's okay too. You can go to the game and just enjoy the atmosphere and the vibes. Let's talk about Nationals Park, which, amazingly, after 15 years, has never been named after a corporate sponsor. That's rare in pro sports. And I have no idea how long that will last, but for now, that's what it's called. Also, a bit of a pet peeve of mine, so let me just get this out of the way now. It's named Nationals Park, not National Stadium, not Nationals Ballpark. It's Nationals Park. Obviously, people will still know what you mean if you call it the wrong thing. This is just a bit of a pet peeve of mine. Nationals Park is located right at the Navy Yard Metro Station. Now, when you get to Navy Yard, there are two exits. Signs will point you to either an exit at New Jersey Avenue or the ballpark exit. You can use either, but the ballpark exit will put you right out on Half Street, which on a game day will be close to traffic and people will be out selling things like peanuts, snacks, t-shirts, etc. You can also get to Nationals Park by bus. The circulator currently runs a route between LaFont Plaza and Eastern Market. If you're coming from an area like The Wharf, this can be a good option. You can also get to a game by bike. Most tourists won't have their own bike, but there is a bicycle valet, which I have used many times and is a great amenity. And for tourists, there are several Capital Bike Share stations within vicinity of the ballpark as well. You can theoretically take a cab or an Uber, though just know that traffic on game days can get heavy, so give yourself plenty of time to account for that. I strongly believe tourists should not be driving cars in D.C., and that applies here too. Don't drive. Parking is limited, and there are better ways to go. If you want to head straight into the stadium, you can go right through the center field gate, which is the closest one to Metro. It's the biggest gate, and the lines usually move pretty quickly. But you can go in any gate with any ticket, so don't stress out about trying to find the right one. If you want to hang out outside the park before the game, there are lots of places on and around Half Street to eat and drink. My two favorites are Walter's Sports Bar and Tap 99 both on N Street, and The Big Stick on M Street. There's also The Bullpen, which is a big open space where you can get drinks, but I never go there. It served a purpose a decade ago before the area around the stadium was built up, but now that there are so many eating and drinking options nearby, it doesn't really make sense to me. Importantly, the Nationals have a clear bag policy. The only bags you are allowed to bring in are clear plastic bags that do not exceed 16 inches by 16 inches by 8 inches. You are not allowed to bring backpacks, coolers, drawstring bags, camera bags, purses, computer bags, and luggage of any kind. 
exceptions may be made for diaper bags and other bags used for medical reasons. But you do have to get approval, and unless you absolutely need an exception, the easiest thing to do is just bring a permitted clear bag or no bag. You can buy clear bags on Amazon or Walmart.com in advance of your trip. If you live in a city with a stadium that has a clear bag policy, maybe you already have one. If you show up with an unapproved bag, then you have to leave it at Bin Box, which is located on the first street side of the park. Now, I personally do not like the clear bag policy. If you've been on a tour with me, you know I use a backpack to carry my things, including my water bottle, umbrella, sunglasses, and other things that I might need. I used to bring that backpack to ball games. But now, if I'm going to go to a game, I need to remember to switch to a clear bag that day or not carry any bag. I'm not a fan, but it is the rule, so you need to know about it. One decision you need to make before you enter the park is whether you're going to eat inside, eat outside, or bring in your own food. Nationals Park has, in my opinion, just okay food. One thing I will give them credit for is that they do invite local restaurants each year as in-park vendors, so there are some decent options. But you will be paying ballpark prices, so it's not necessarily going to be cheap. Like I mentioned before, there are lots of places to eat outside the stadium, and I posted a video last year on YouTube of a walk around the area on a game day so you can see what those options are. One hack that I think is very important and that a lot of people even locals don't know about, is that Nationals Park does allow outside food. So it is possible to stop at one of the places outside the park, buy something to eat, and bring it in with you. Here is what the current outside food policy says. Quote, Single serving food items may be brought into Nationals Park, as long as they are contained in one of the approved bags under the Nationals current bag policy, or carried in your hands so the food items can be safely screened by security. Metal or glass containers of any kind are prohibited. End quote. You are also allowed to bring in one sealed bottle of water per person. The bottle must be unopened and not frozen. I really do think this is an underappreciated benefit. This policy has been this way at Nationals Park for as long as I can remember. It's still in place in 2024 and hopefully will be in place for many years to come. Probably the biggest complaint I hear people make about attending games is that they say the food is too expensive or that it's overpriced. And if you believe that, then here's your opportunity to eat basically whatever you want at the game at non-ballpark prices. For me, when I take advantage of this policy, I find it works best with foods like sandwiches, chips, and candy. So I might stop at Potbelly and pick up a sandwich and chips and bring that in. I also sometimes buy bags of peanuts at the supermarket and bring those in, as I do enjoy peanuts at a baseball game, and the prices are about 50% lower at the store. I would not recommend trying to bring in food that's greasy, like Five Guys. I would also not recommend trying to bring food that's generally messy, like a Chipotle burrito. Something like a sweet green salad is okay, as long as you're willing to be that person eating a salad at a baseball game. And no judgment, because I've done it plenty of times. But if the food you bring requires a fork, make sure you have a plastic fork, because I once brought a salad and forgot to grab the fork, and it is shockingly difficult to find a plastic fork inside the ballpark, believe it or not. A related complaint to the one about the food being overpriced is that the beer is overpriced. And look, I'm not going to argue with this one on its face, but it is a time-honored tradition to overpay for beer at a sporting event. If you want to drink alcohol, you have to pay for that privilege. That said, I also have a hack for this. The Nationals have always had some version of an in-game happy hour. It's changed a bit over the years. But for 2024, you can get $5 cans of Budweiser, Bud Light, and Michelob Ultra, and $6 cans of Budweiser Black Cherry Seltzer. The happy hour special is automatically applied to all orders placed at the Budweiser Brew House, Budweiser Terrace, and Ultra Loft from when gates open through the scheduled first pitch. So what you can do, and what I do, is pick up a couple of cans during the happy hour before the game, carry them back to your seat, 
and you've got your beers for the first few innings. And honestly, $5 per can is very reasonable. I know it's not the fanciest selection of craft beers, but for a ball game, the choices are all fine. One last thing I'll say about beer is that the menu price for beer is outrageous, and you can get serious sticker shock from it. But before you get too angry, notice that a lot of the canned beers they sell at Nationals Park are huge 24 or 25 ounce cans. A 25 ounce can is basically two regular cans of beer combined into one. So once you divide the menu price in half, it's not quite as rage inducing. As far as where to sit, there are many choices at many price points. There isn't really a bad seat in the park per se. However, I personally have a hard time seeing the game from the outfield as my eyesight is not so great. So I try to choose a seat behind home plate or on the baselines if possible. The third base side of the park is the shade side and the first base side is the sun side, which can be important during the summer months. I will leave a blog post in the show notes with more details about where you can find the shade. Nationals.com is the official ticketing site. SeatGeek is the official resale site for all MLB teams. I have bought from both and have never had any problems. I know some people don't like the resale sites because they think it's all scalpers selling at high prices. But in my experience, that's only really true for sold out events. For your run of the mill regular season game, a lot of the tickets are just season ticket holders trying to sell their tickets because they can't make it. I've gotten some amazing deals over the years. Last year, I bought premium seats right behind home plate at a huge discount because it was a Tuesday night game against the Marlins and the weather was not great. So the demand for that game was low and that wound up being great for me. Whether you use the official site or SeatGeek, you will need the Ballpark app, which is where your tickets will be delivered to. Nationals Park is paperless now, so you do have to have a phone with the Ballpark app in order to enter. I strongly recommend taking care of buying your tickets and installing apps either before you leave for your trip or at least before you leave your hotel for the day. Trying to do all of this out on the street outside the park is going to be awkward and uncomfortable. For the 2024 season, the Nationals have moved up the start time for evening games. Most evening games now start at 645, and I think this is great. Combined with faster games due to the new pace of play rules, the game should be over before 10 o'clock. And as someone who is not a night owl, I am a fan of this. After the game ends, most fans will go back to Metro, which is the best way to leave. Calling an Uber immediately after a game can be challenging, and there are designated pickup spots where you have to go for your ride. So pay attention to the app for that info. And just to address it now, and this will apply to some other teams as well, people want to know if Metro is safe after a game, since it will be after dark and somewhat late. I personally think it's very safe. If you're leaving immediately after the game, there will be tons of other fans on the train with you. There is definitely strength in numbers, so as long as you're leaving immediately after the game ends, I think it should feel fine, even at a later hour. In addition to the game itself, there's in-between inning entertainment. There's the stuff that every team has, like the t-shirt toss and the dance cam, but the best and most unique thing at a Nationals game is the racing presidents. The presidents race happens in the middle of the fourth inning, and you get to see mascot versions of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abe Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt race around the perimeter of the field. It's a lot of fun, so make sure you don't get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the fourth inning. Now, before we move on to the next sport, I want to mention the Baltimore Orioles. Sometimes people really want to go to a baseball game, but because of the scheduling, the Orioles are at home and the Nationals are not during their trip dates. It is very much possible to day trip to Baltimore. It's actually one of the few places I do recommend for a day trip. It's also very much possible to pop up for an Orioles game and come right back to D.C. The best way to do this is to find a weeknight game that fits your schedule. There is a commuter rail system in Maryland called MARC, which stands for Maryland Area Regional Commuter. There are two lines that run between D.C. and Baltimore. 
the Penn Line, which runs between Union Station in D.C. and Baltimore Penn Station. It operates seven days per week, all day long. And the Camden Line, which runs between Union Station in D.C. and Baltimore Camden Station. It operates only on weekdays during rush hour. The Camden Line is awesome because it drops you literally right outside the ballpark at Camden Yards. So what you can do is take the Camden Line up, catch a game, and then go to Penn Station and catch the Penn Line back to D.C. Let me give you an actual example to demonstrate how this would be done. On the day I'm recording this, Monday, April 29th, the Orioles are playing a home game against the Yankees at 6.35 p.m. There is a Camden Line train that leaves Union Station in D.C. at 4.13 p.m. and gets into Camden Station at 5.25. That gives you a solid hour to hang out and get situated in the park before the game. To get back, there is a Mark Penn Line train at 9.35 or an Amtrak train at 10.33, both from Baltimore Penn Station. Unfortunately, Penn Station is about two miles from Camden Yards, so you will need to account for extra travel time to get there. If you want to catch that Mark train, you may need to leave the game a bit early. If you opt for the Amtrak train, you will more likely be able to attend the whole game. Mark train tickets can be purchased from a machine at the station. Amtrak tickets I strongly suggest buying in advance using the Amtrak app. There is always a small chance that the train you want to take is sold out. And if it is, you could get stuck and that is not what you want. Camden Yards has more or less the same clear bag policy as Nationals Park and the same outside food policy. I don't really go to enough Orioles games to have any particularly useful tips, but one place nearby I do like to go before and after games is Pratt Street Ale House. Some friends of mine who used to live in Baltimore were regulars there and it really grew on me. It does get crowded on game days though, so be aware of that. The Nationals and Orioles have always had a bit of a contentious relationship. When the Expos moved from Montreal to D.C., all MLB owners, except the owner of the Orioles, voted in approval. He kind of infamously said there are no baseball fans in D.C., which has proven to be very much untrue. That owner has since passed away, and a new group of owners, including David Rubenstein, who is much more liked in D.C., has taken over. So we'll see if the relationship improves. The last time the Orioles won the World Series was in 1983. The previous owner really... To put it gently, underinvested in the team, which I know upset a lot of Orioles fans. But Camden Yards is one of the more iconic MLB stadiums, and even when the team is not great, it's still a fun place to go. And there are high hopes that the new owners might be willing to invest in the team now. Okay, so that's a lot of info about baseball. Let's move on to the next sport, which is soccer. And I'm choosing soccer next because... I also consider it a fairly tourist-friendly sport. We have multiple professional soccer teams in D.C., and the season overlaps with both peak spring break and summer tourist seasons. Our two professional soccer teams are D.C. United in the MLS, or Major League Soccer, and the Washington Spirit in the NWSL, or National Women's Soccer League. I'm going to refer to these by acronyms from now on for efficiency. The MLS regular season this year runs from February all the way through October, and the NWSL regular season runs from March through November. DC United was one of the founding teams in MLS almost 30 years ago. They hold the distinction of having won the most MLS Cups, four of them. However, they also haven't won one in the last 20 years. So a lot of the team's success came at the very beginning. Since they've been around for a while, I do feel like DC United has a pretty dedicated fan base. In 2024, DC United home games are on Saturdays or Wednesdays, usually in the evening, but there are occasionally day games early in the season. The Washington Spirit was one of the founding teams in the NWSL since it was created in 2012. They have won one NWSL championship in 2021. I feel like they have a rapidly growing fan base, and 
even if not quite as big as DC United, it's getting closer every year. In 2024, Spirit home games are on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, though start times range from early in the day at noon to 7.30 in the evening. My understanding is that the NWSL has a new TV deal, and they're trying to space out games at different times for maximum exposure. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but it seems plausible to me. Both teams play at Audi Field, which is next door neighbors with Nationals Park. So pretty much everything I'm going to say next applies to both teams. The best way to get to Audi Field is on Metro. You'll use the Navy Yard Station, same as for Nationals Park. It's a bit of a longer walk though. The easiest way to do this is to use the ballpark exit walk down half street towards Nationals Park, then turn right and walk towards South Capitol Street, down South Capitol Street until you get to the island crossing. Don't stress out about this too much. There will be other fans on Metro that you can more or less follow or ask for help if you are truly lost. It is also possible to arrive by bike. Audi Field has a bicycle valet and Capital Bike Share stations outside. Taxi or Uber is also theoretically possible but traffic can get pretty gnarly by the stadium, so definitely give yourself plenty of time to arrive if you choose that option. Unlike baseball, soccer doesn't have many natural breaks aside from halftime. So as soon as the game ends, everyone will more or less leave all at once, and there will be a huge parade of people walking back to the Navy Yard Metro, as it's the way most people go. So just follow the crowd, and you should be fine. Audi Field does have a fairly restrictive bag policy, but it's different than Nationals Park. At Audi Field, the bags must be no larger than 14 by 14 by 6 inches. No backpacks, coolers, luggage, large purses, or any other bags that exceed the limit are allowed. The bag does not have to be clear, but the total size is smaller than at Nationals Park. Again, I am personally not a fan of these bag policies, but they are what they are, so it's best to know and prepare. Outside, food and beverage is prohibited at Audi Field. Certain medical exceptions, as well as exceptions for children and infants, can be made on a case-by-case basis, but for most people, don't bring your own food. Outside water is also not allowed, with the only exception being if DC is under a heat advisory, one sealed bottle of water is allowed per person. I think this is silly, and they should just allow you to bring in one water bottle like at Nationals Park, but alas. The concessions inside Audi Field are just okay, in my opinion. They'll get the job done if you're hungry, but nothing worth raving about. There are some premium tickets that include food and beverage, and I have splurged on these a few times in the past. I do feel like those can be actually a decent value if you eat the equivalent of a full meal and get a couple of drinks. Otherwise, I would probably eat outside the stadium before or after the match. Two of my favorite places nearby are Walter's Sports Bar, which is on N Street, on the walkover from the Metro, and Solace Brewing Company Outpost, which is on the waterfront. But again, there are a lot of places to eat in this area, so check out my game day walk to see where else you can go. Like I mentioned at the beginning, soccer culture in the U.S. is very different than in other countries. Generally speaking, the U.S. does not have the same soccer hooliganism as in other places. I know people have opinions about this, and I can only tell you my own. I think U.S. soccer culture is better if you're a casual fan, if you're someone who wants to try a game and see if you like it. I think in other countries, it can be so intense and overwhelming that if you're not 110% committed, then it's not going to be a fun time. If you want that extreme experience, you're not going to get it here. I didn't grow up watching soccer. I only got into it as an adult, and I do feel like the more casual environment made it possible for me to get into it as an adult. I don't think I would have started liking it if I had to be thrown to the wolves. One important thing to note when it comes to choosing your seats is that the supporters section is located behind the north goal. These are standing sections, and depending on the game, these are often the least expensive to buy if you sort by lowest to highest priced. The supporters section is supposed to be for the biggest fans and generally more rowdy than elsewhere in the stadium. So be careful not to accidentally choose these if you don't want them. 
of the two teams, it feels to me like the Spirits marketing makes the games seem more kid-friendly and family-friendly. And I will also say that most DC United games are on Saturday night, and Saturday nights tend to be the most alcohol-fueled period of the week. So just that alone is probably going to make the atmosphere a little more rowdy than if it was on a work night or if it was a day game. That said, the soccer schedule is long, and the games are pretty spaced out, so if there is a match during your trip dates, either United or Spirit, I think either would be good to check out. Ticketmaster, love or hate em, is the official ticketing site for both United and Spirit. It's also the app you'll need to get into the game. Even if you buy your tickets on a resale site, you'll still need Ticketmaster to receive your tickets. Once you're at the game, you can use either the Ticketmaster app to scan in, or you can transfer your tickets to the Apple Wallet or Google Wallet, which is personally how I do it. All right, now let's move on to football. Football is the most popular sport in the U.S., according to the Gallup poll. Though locally, the Nationals are the most popular team, according to a Washington Post poll, with the Commanders, our football team, in number two. I think that's probably accurate, and I will explain a bit more about why in a moment. I personally think football is the least tourist-friendly sport. And unless you are a fan of the Commanders or the visiting team, I wouldn't really recommend trying to add a game to your itinerary. So let's talk about the Commanders, the local NFL team that was previously called the Washington football team, and before that, the Washington Redskins. If you're listening to this in the future, it may be rebranded entirely again, as that idea has been tossed around. According to the Washington Post poll I mentioned, the Commanders were by far the most popular local team in 2010 and has absolutely plummeted in popularity to the point where they were number two last year. So what happened? In short, two decades of terrible ownership that was plagued by mismanagement, scandal, and general contempt for fans of the team. We call this the Dan Snyder era. And I personally gave up on this team during the Dan Snyder era. And I know I'm not the only one. The last time the Commanders won the Super Bowl was back in 1991, and they have greatly underperformed pretty much for the entirety of the Snyder era. That said, the team was finally sold to new owners in 2023, and Dan Snyder is out of the picture. I think this is a great step for the franchise, but I also feel like after all these years, the new owners need to win back trust and they don't just get it for free. We'll see what happens. Now, there are three general reasons why I consider the Commanders to be the least tourist-friendly sport. First, Commanders Field, formerly called FedEx Field, is far from the city and not easy to get to. Second, Commanders Field is generally considered one of the worst venues in all of the NFL. And third, Commander's games don't really have good family-friendly vibes, which may or may not matter depending on whether you're traveling with kids. Let's start with Commander's Field, which until recently was called FedEx Field, and in the future may be called something else. I'm going to call it Commander's Field for this episode. Commander's Field is located in Landover, Maryland. It's surrounded by an ocean of parking, and many fans do arrive by car and pay a lot of money to park in one of the stadium lots. I do not recommend tourists in D.C. drive, so for an out-of-towner, you will probably arrive by Metro. Commander's Field is kinda sorta Metro accessible. The closest station is Morgan Boulevard on the Blue and Silver Lines, and then a one-mile walk from there to the stadium. One mile is technically walkable, and it takes about 20 minutes. The problem is that Morgan Boulevard is a massive six-lane strode with tiny sidewalks. It's in a suburb that I think almost everyone would describe as not particularly pedestrian-friendly. The good news is that you'll likely be making the hike from the Metro with a bunch of other football fans, and there is safety in numbers. The not-so-good news is that it's not really comfortable with everyone crammed on those tiny sidewalks. It's arguably even worse after the game, with lots of people trying to go to the Metro crammed onto those sidewalks, while everyone tries to leave the parking lots at exactly the same time. At least before the game, people arrive in a more staggered way, whereas where afterwards, it's just a mad rush. 
So the fact that Commander's Field is inconvenient and difficult to get to is the first reason I think it's not particularly a tourist-friendly sport. The second reason is because I think Commander's Field just isn't a good venue generally. If you ever look at the lists that rank stadiums and ballparks from best to worst, Commander's Field is almost always at the very bottom of the list, if not ranked dead last. When it opened, it was one of the largest stadiums in the NFL, which is not necessarily a good thing. A massive stadium means potentially a lot of seats with less than stellar views. And even though it's less than 30 years old, it feels like it's aged terribly with poor infrastructure, uncomfortable seats, and unappealing restrooms and concession areas. An old stadium is not necessarily bad. There are plenty of stadiums much older that are still beloved because they aged better and were generally better invested in over the years. And the last reason I don't think Commander's games are particularly tourist-friendly is because they are not really kid-friendly or family-friendly. Now, maybe this point doesn't matter if you're not traveling with kids, but I know a lot of podcast listeners are families with kids, so this might just be the deal-breaker. The NFL is generally less kid-friendly than other sports. A lot of fans tend to go heavy on alcohol, you have tailgating culture, and because there are so few games during the season, each game holds a lot more weight for the success of the team. Some might argue that this is what makes the NFL exciting, and I'm not going to argue with that, but it also means that for the more casual fans, it can be a bit overwhelming. The commanders do follow the NFL's clear bag policy, which limits you to a clear plastic bag that does not exceed 12 by 6 by 12. This is similar but slightly different from the clear bag policy at Nationals Park, so please double check to make sure your bag meets those dimensions. I know this is annoying and frustrating, but it's better to be prepared than to be surprised. Outside food and beverages are not allowed. If you do decide to check out a Commander's game at home, SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner. They have both box office tickets and resale tickets. The cost of tickets is a vast range. In seasons when the team is performing okay and has a chance of making the playoffs, ticket prices can be high. In the seasons when the commanders stink and season ticket holders have given up, you can find some pretty cheap resale tickets. You should definitely download the SeatGeek app before you depart for the game. Most commanders games are on Sundays at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Sometimes they get scheduled for Sunday night or Monday night games at home, Those can be challenging to attend because the team has to pay to keep Metro open late, and you need to make sure you catch the last train so you're not stuck out in Landover late at night. For a typical afternoon game, because it starts right in the middle of the day, attending a commander's game means you're pretty much dedicating an entire day to this activity. When you include transportation time, plus the fact that the NFL now has the longest games, from start to finish at 3 hours and 12 minutes on average. Compare this to going to another sport where it might be an evening activity that still lets you do all your standard touristy things during the day. An NFL game is more or less an all-day commitment. Now, what about the Baltimore Ravens? What if your trip dates don't line up with the commander's schedule, but you really want to see an NFL game? Just like the Orioles, it is possible to go up to Baltimore to catch a Ravens game. The Mark Penn line runs seven days per week, but it's important to know that on Sundays it runs a reduced schedule. What I'm about to tell you only works for a one o'clock Sunday Ravens game, but if that's what's scheduled, this should work. The current Penn line schedule has a train departing from Washington Union Station at 10.25 a.m. and arriving at Baltimore Penn Station at 11.28 a.m. There's a return train departing Baltimore Penn Station at 6 o'clock p.m., and arriving at Washington Union Station at 7.05 p.m. Penn Station is about two miles from M&T Bank Stadium where the Ravens play, so you will need to account for transportation time and cost from there. M&T Bank Stadium is located in downtown Baltimore, next to Camden Yards and the Baltimore Inner Harbor. I do think it's a more tourist-friendly location with restaurants nearby, and it's a little bit more walkable and even a more vibrant area. And these times are current as of May 2024, but obviously could change, so always double-check the Mark Train schedule before you attempt this. As far as the game day experience goes, I haven't really been to enough Ravens games to really have much of an opinion of my own. While Commander Stadium is generally considered the pits and the worst of the worst, 
M&T Bank Stadium is generally considered more middle of the pack. An okay stadium, but one that's not particularly beloved. For someone who has never been to an NFL game before, the fact that it's an okay stadium in a more tourist-friendly downtown location might make it the better choice. But again, to attend a 1 o'clock Ravens game from D.C. basically means sacrificing an entire day for this activity, which may or may not be what you want. One more professional football team that you may not even know exists is the D.C. Defenders, part of the United Football League, or UFL. I debated about whether or not to include this team in this episode because I feel like this league has started and stopped so many times over the years, it's hard to know whether it will even exist next year. But for now, in 2024, I'll describe what it is. If you've never heard of the UFL, perhaps you've heard of the XFL, which was the league that the DC Defenders was in previously. This is the league originally started by Vince McMahon from professional wrestling back in 2001. The league folded, then was brought back right in time for COVID, folded again, then was brought back again by Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Then that version of the XFL merged with the USFL to form the current league called the UFL. Don't worry about the details, they aren't really important, other than to understand that this is not exactly the most stable professional sports league out there. In any case, the UFL season runs counter to the NFL season. In 2024, the regular season runs late March through early June, plus the playoffs. There are eight teams in this league. The DC Defenders play at Audi Field, which can be converted for football. All of the previous Audi Field guidance that I gave in the soccer section applies, as they are Audi Field rules, not team-specific rules. UFL games are on Saturdays and Sundays. They are mostly day games, but a little bit more tourist-friendly in the sense that Audi Field is right in the city, so there's a lot less time spent commuting back and forth. All right, we've covered a lot already, and we still have basketball, hockey, and the other sports to get to, but I desperately need a coffee refill, so let's take a one-minute break and then get back to it. If you're listening to this podcast, my hunch is that you're probably planning an upcoming trip to Washington, D.C., or at least dreaming about a future adventure. One thing I've learned from meeting thousands of travelers and doing a bit of traveling myself over the years is that experiences are usually the best memories from a trip. That's why I started Trip Hacks DC. I didn't just want to create content to help you plan a trip, but also to provide an amazing experience once you arrive. And I think it's worked because people tell me all the time that their Trip Hacks DC tour was the highlight of their trip, and that really makes me happy. So if that's something that sounds up your alley, you can head over to TripHacksDC.com to learn about taking a private tour with me or a public group tour with one of the amazing TripHacksDC tour guides. And we're back. Now before we get to basketball and hockey, I do want to address the elephant in the room. Last year, on December 13th, 2023, the owner of the Wizards and Capitals, and yes, it's the same owner for both, got together with the governor of Virginia and some other people, stood under a huge circus tent, and announced that the teams were moving from D.C. to Virginia. Well, spoiler, he then proceeded to completely bungle that deal with the Virginia legislature, and the teams are not, in fact, moving to Virginia. These guys were out there in December, metaphorically popping the celebratory champagne before the game even started. The teams are staying in D.C. where they are now. People want to know my opinion about this whole situation, and I'll say it now and then we won't talk about it again. I think the whole situation stinks. I have lost all respect for Ted Leonsis, the owner of these teams. I think the situation stinks because we just crawled out from decades of terrible ownership of the football team, only for another owner to waste no time showing his true colors. I think Ted burned a lot of goodwill for basically nothing. I could seriously rant on this topic for an entire hour, and if you sign up for one of my private tours and want my full-blown thoughts on all of it, I am happy to give it. But for now, this episode is not for that. So as much as I want to keep going, that's all I'll say. Okay, let's start with basketball. 
Washington, D.C. has an NBA team, the Washington Wizards. This franchise has been in D.C. since 1973, though, to be honest, they have not been the most successful team in modern sports history. The last time they won the NBA championship was back in 1978. The last time they even made the playoffs was for the 2020-21 season and were quickly swept out in the first round. That said, having a less than successful team as far as winning percentage goes has pros and cons. The cons are obvious. People like rooting for a winning team. And also, if you're not a winning team, you probably don't have the biggest superstars either. On the plus side, tickets are easy to get, they're inexpensive, and the overall game day experience can still be fun. The Wizards play at Capital One Arena, which is the easiest venue to get to as a tourist, as it is literally located on top of the Gallery Place metro station. Gallery Place is on the red, yellow, and green lines, so if you're coming from any of those, you don't even need to transfer. If you're riding to Gallery Place, you can use the 7th and F, as in Frank, street exit, and basically proceed directly into the arena. If you're coming in on the orange, blue, or silver lines, you have two choices. Most people will transfer at Metro Center to the red line and ride one extra stop to Gallery Place. An alternative that some people like to do is to use the 11th and G Street exit at Metro Center and you only have to walk two blocks to get to the arena. I will personally say that if I was coming to a game, I would get off at Metro Center rather than transfer, because I'm familiar with the Metro Center station and know how to get to that 11th and G Street exit. Metro Center has four exits, and it's easy to get turned around if you're new to the station. So I don't think there's a universal right or wrong answer here. If you're feeling confident in your metro skills and can navigate to the 11th and G exit, go for it. If you're not feeling confident enough, no problem. Just transfer and ride that extra stop to Gallery Place. Capital One Arena has one of the most restrictive bag policies of all the venues. Capital One Arena has a strict no bag policy, which means bags, backpacks, and purses are not permitted. Wallet size clutches no larger than 5 by 7 inches are okay, and medical bags and parenting bags no larger than 14 by 14 by 6 inches will be permitted, but you have to use the entrance on the corner of 6th and F and have them checked. No outside food or beverages are allowed at Capital One Arena. On a related note, the various and inconsistent security procedures, not just at sports games, but at a lot of tourist sites is the reason why I recommend choosing a hotel in a central location. If your hotel is way out in the suburbs and you're commuting in and out, you have to make some difficult decisions about what you can carry with you and what you're going to do with it if it's not allowed somewhere. It's just so much easier to have a hotel that can serve as your home base that you can go back to midday as needed. I highly recommend podcast episode number 37 about where to stay if you're struggling with deciding where to choose your hotel. If you want to eat before the game, the good news is there are lots of options in the area around the arena. Now, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The area around the arena was really hard hit during COVID, and it has struggled to come back compared to other areas. I think it's fair to say the area has fallen a bit from its peak, but it's also not the doom and gloom that some people make it out to be. My two favorite spots nearby are Daikaya, which is ramen, and Haleo, Jose Andrea's Spanish tapas place. If you want something quick, there's Nando's, Shake Shack, and Hip City Veg all nearby. Clyde's is the staple restaurant in this area. It's not one of my personal favorites, but I know a lot of people have had good experiences there, and I generally trust they will give you a solid meal. At least right now, in 2024, the area around Capital One Arena is in a bit of flux. The announcement of the teams moving to Virginia, followed by the abrupt reversal, has caused a lot of uncertainty for businesses in this area. And I can tell you, as a business owner, it sucks trying to navigate around uncertainty. That said, the deal for the teams to stay in D.C. included making improvements to the arena, both internal and external, and potentially some changes to the surrounding area. I can't say exactly how this will all look in a few years, but at least the teams will be playing here for a few more decades. 
One more thing to mention is that Capital One Arena is in the area of downtown DC called Chinatown. And people sometimes ask me about getting Chinese food here. You can. There are some Chinese restaurants. But unfortunately, DC's Chinatown is not like the one in San Francisco or in New York. It's really a shell of a former Chinatown. What happened to Chinatown could be its own entire podcast episode, but the short of it is that the best Chinese restaurants are now located in the suburbs. So if you want the best of the best, you have to travel for it. Ticketmaster is the official ticketing partner for the Wizards. They sell both box office tickets and are the verified resale site. This is where I personally buy Wizards tickets. Wizards tickets are easy to get. The prices are relatively low. If you're willing to sit in the upper deck, you can get tickets for really cheap. And if you want to sit closer to the court, you can get tickets that I wouldn't call cheap, but I would call a pretty good value. The NBA season runs from October through April and then the playoffs. Though honestly, with the Wizards lately, I really wouldn't count on there being playoffs. Wizards' regular season home games are almost exclusively scheduled to start at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, with a few late afternoon games mixed in on Sundays and holidays. I think this makes it one of the best tourist-friendly sports, because you can do all your daytime touristy activities, swing by your hotel to drop off a few things, and then head out to an evening basketball game, which is also kid-friendly and family-friendly. NBA games are also pretty short, usually between two hours and two and a half hours, including halftime and stoppages. Obviously, if there's overtime, it can go a bit longer, but for the most part, if a game starts at 7 o'clock, you can be pretty confident you'll be out of there by 9.30. So that's the Wizards. Washington, D.C. has another professional basketball team, the Washington Mystics. The Mystics were not a founding team in the WNBA, but they joined one year later, in 1998. They have put up some competitive teams in modern history, especially in the years when they had Elena Deladon as their star player. The Mystics won the WNBA championship in 2019, and in my opinion, were absolutely robbed of the opportunity to have a proper celebratory season as champs, since the 2020 season was disrupted because of COVID. They also never got a celebratory parade because so many players had to leave immediately after the championship to go play in other leagues. Both the Mystics and Nationals won their respective championships in 2019, And even though the Nationals did get a parade, I feel like both teams were really done dirty by COVID and never got to properly celebrate. Practically speaking, the Mystics play at Entertainment and Sports Arena. It's a 4,200-seat arena mainly used for basketball. Even though this episode is about professional sports, I'll quickly call out that the Capital City Go-Go's also play here. They are the local NBA G League team. WNBA venues range quite a bit, from really small and intimate arenas like this one to big NBA arenas that they share with the WNBA teams. There are pros and cons to both. On the one hand, from a fan perspective, I do like that when you go to a Mystics game at Entertainment and Sports Arena, it feels like even the worst seat in the place is still extremely good and close to the court. On the other hand, it feels like a professional sports team deserves more than a venue that's approximately the same size as a high school arena. There has been chatter of moving the Mystics back to Capital One Arena, and they are playing at least one game there in the upcoming season against the Indiana Fever, so keep an eye out if you're listening to this in the future to see where they might be playing. Entertainment and Sports Arena is one of the less convenient places for tourists to get to. Though, objectively, it's not too bad. It is adjacent to the Congress Heights metro station on the Green Line. Unfortunately, it is only on one line, so unless you're coming from somewhere on the Green Line, you'll have to transfer at Gallery Place or LaFont Plaza. Once you get off at Congress Heights, it's only a three-minute walk from the metro. The bag policy at Entertainment and Sports Arena is similar to Capital One Arena. Wallet size clutches no larger than 5 by 7 inches, and medical bags or parenting bags no larger than 14 by 14 by 6 are permitted. There are no bag checks or bag storage, so you really want to make sure you only come with what you need. Outside food and beverage is prohibited, and unfortunately, there really are no restaurants in the immediate vicinity of the arena. So I highly recommend planning to eat before or after the game. Otherwise, it's going to be concession stand food for your dinner. Ticketmaster is the official ticketing partner for the Mystics. They sell both box office tickets and are the verified resale site. 
I personally think the Mystics offer the best value in DC when it comes to the quality of play relative to the price that you pay. You can usually get tickets in the lower level of the arena for very reasonable prices. If you've ever wanted to sit close to the court, but the price has been out of reach, I highly recommend checking out if you can catch a Mystics game while you're here. The WNBA season runs counter to the NBA season, from May through September and then the playoffs. Mystics' regular season home games are either evening games tipping off at 7 o'clock or late afternoon games at 3 o'clock. In 2024, there are a few other start times mixed in too. The WNBA season does overlap with peak tourist season in the summer, and Mystics games are very kid-friendly and family-friendly, so if you have kids who like playing or watching basketball, it can be a lot of fun for them. Okay, let's move on to hockey. Washington, D.C.'s professional hockey team is the Washington Capitals. And before I go any further, I want to acknowledge that two years ago, I made a video titled The Ultimate Washington, D.C. Travel Guide, and I had a very short section about professional sports, and I did not include a Capitals logo. I feel like that video actually has a lot of really good info, but I got so many comments that were like, why do you hate hockey? Or how could you forget about the Caps? And it's not that I forgot, it's just that I didn't think I needed every single logo on a slide that was basically just intended to say, hey, there's a lot of professional sports that you can see while you're here. So I'm sorry about that. I don't hate the Capitals. I quite like them. But I also have to admit that hockey is probably my least favorite sport to attend in person for a few reasons. The first is that I didn't grow up playing or watching it. My elementary school did not have a hockey team. It did have baseball, basketball, and football, and that's primarily what I grew up with. I did try getting into hockey after college. I went to games. However, the struggle I always had is that since I don't have great eyesight and I use contacts to see, I've always had a hard time following the puck and everything else that's happening on the ice. I find hockey a lot easier to watch on TV. But this isn't a podcast episode about watching sports on TV, so that's not what we're going to talk about. The Capitals have been around since 1974 and have played at Capital One Arena since it opened in 1997. They have won one Stanley Cup, which was in 2018, and it was one of the most exciting times in D.C. sports, honestly. Between the celebration outside the arena on the night they won to the victory parade, it was all very memorable. Compared to the Wizards, the Capitals have had a lot more recent success, and their games, therefore, are better attended and harder to get tickets for. In fact, the Capitals had a 588-game home sellout streak that just ended last year in 2023. It's worth saying, though, that even if a game is sold out, it doesn't mean you can't get tickets. There are always tickets available for sale. Season ticket holders can't attend every game, and there is a fairly robust resale market. So if you want to go, you can go. Ticketmaster is the official ticketing partner for the Capitals. They sell both box office tickets and are the verified resale site. The NHL season runs from September through April, and then the playoffs. This overlaps almost entirely with the NBA season, so the Wizards and Capitals trade off game days at Capital One Arena. Capitals games tend to be more intense than Wizards games. I think that's a combination of the nature of the sport, being a more physical game, and the fact that the Capitals have a more dedicated fan base right now than the Wizards. If you're already a hockey fan, I think it can be a great experience. If you're not a hockey fan, it might be a little intimidating, but I still think you can go for sure. Just know it's going to be a bit more intense atmosphere than some of the other sports. Since the Capitals play at Capital One Arena, all of the tips I gave previously for the Wizards apply, including transportation, bag policy, and where to eat around the arena. And that wraps it up for the Big Five Sports. Wow, it feels like that took a while. But like I promised at the beginning, I also want to cover other pro sports, college sports, and give my general tips. So let's take another one-minute break and then get back to it. Hey, did you know that Trip Hacks DC is more than just this podcast? Trip Hacks DC is also a YouTube channel with hundreds of videos on everything from how to ride the metro to neighborhood guides to seasonal tourism updates, as well as short video Q&As and other fun stuff. And of course, TripHacks DC is a tour company because I don't just want to help you plan a trip, I want to show you around once you get here. 
For summer 2024, there are three Trip Hacks DC tours on the calendar. Private tours with me, which is exclusive to your group or family. Semi-private tours with me, which are capped at only 10 tickets per tour to maintain that small group vibe. And the monumental trivia tour with Christine, the public tour that is great for smaller groups and solo travelers. You can get more info about all of these and go ahead and sign up over at the website triphexdc.com. And we're back. One of the most tourist-friendly sports, in my opinion, is tennis. Tennis is a lot different from other team sports because it's played in tournaments that are constantly moving locations. I think most casual sports fans are at least aware of the Grand Slam tournaments. The Australian Open, French Open, Wimbledon, and U.S. Open. There are plenty of big tournaments played outside of those as well. In D.C., we have a 500-level tournament called the Washington Open, though it's currently called the Mubadala City D.C. Open. If the corporate sponsor changes in the future, just Google Washington Open Tennis and you should be able to find it. A 500-level tournament is not the highest tier of professional tennis. That would be a 1,000-level tournament. But 500-level is still pretty prestigious. For example, last year, the women's champion was Coco Gauff. She went on to win the entire U.S. Open a month later. And back in 2019, the men's winner was Yannick Sinner, and he just won the Australian Open earlier this year. My point is to say that this is a tournament that attracts pretty big star power, and you can potentially see these players a lot closer up than you would at an event like the U.S. Open in New York City. The tournament itself is pretty short, only about one week long, straddling two weekends and the week between. It's usually at the end of July or beginning of August. This year, it's both. It runs from July 27th through August 4th. DC is one of the earliest tournaments during what's called the North American Hard Court season, when there are consecutive tournaments in DC, Toronto, Montreal, Cincinnati, and then the US Open in New York City. I understand why they schedule it this way, but the downside is that they schedule an outdoor tennis tournament in Washington, D.C. during the hottest time of the year. It can get pretty rough. The Washington Open is held at the William H.G. Fitzgerald Tennis Center, which is in a section of Rock Creek Park off of 16th Street Northwest. It's pretty far uptown in an area that tourists rarely visit. It's also, unfortunately, not particularly metro accessible. So your options for transportation are either to take one of the metro buses that runs up 16th Street, or check if the tournament is running a shuttle from one of the metro stations. I have seen them do this in the past. Otherwise, a taxi or Uber might actually be the best way to go. Tennis tournaments are different from other pro sports because you don't buy a ticket to a single match. You buy a ticket for either the day session or the night session on a given day. Within the day session, there are several matches, and you can watch one or all of them if you want. In addition to the main court, there are also usually matches scheduled on the outside courts, which are smaller courts that usually have bleachers set up for fans. SeatGeek is the official ticketing partner for the Washington Open. This is a pretty popular event, and the Fitzgerald Tennis Center has a relatively small capacity, so a lot of tickets do get purchased by people who buy packages, and then they get resold. A lot of people buy packages because they like having the option of choosing which sessions to attend and then selling their leftovers. You will generally have the easiest time finding inexpensive tickets on the weekdays versus weekends. One of the most important things to know if you're going to attend is that the Fitzgerald Tennis Center is an outdoor stadium with virtually no shade. So if you're buying tickets for an afternoon session, you're probably going to roast. The tournament has a clear bag policy. Maximum dimensions are 12 by 12 by 6 inches. You are allowed one unopened see-through plastic water bottle per person up to one liter. I absolutely recommend bringing a full one liter bottle because it is critical to stay hydrated at an event like this. Also, make sure to wear a hat, sunglasses, or whatever you need for sun protection. And use the highest SPF sunscreen you have available. I have seen sunscreen given out for free at tennis tournaments before, but I can't say for certain it will happen again in the future, so it's best to use your own. Unfortunately, since this event is only about a week long, unless you get extremely lucky with your timing, you're probably not going to be in D.C. when it's happening. 
But if you're a tennis fan and want to travel to D.C. for the tournament, I can support that. Let's move next to Professional Ultimate Frisbee. And yes, Ultimate Frisbee is very different from Frisbee Golf. Both are played with Frisbees, but they are very different games. I bring this up because I've learned from talking about this on my own tours that a lot of people don't know the difference. Ultimate Frisbee is kind of a hybrid of football and soccer, where the goal is to advance the Frisbee down the field to the end zone. You can't run with the Frisbee, and once a player catches it, they have to pass it to another player on their team on the field. In my opinion, it's a great spectator sport because it's fast-paced, there's a lot of running and jumping, and it's a relatively simple game with easy-to-learn rules. Washington, D.C. has two professional ultimate teams, the D.C. Breeze of the Ultimate Frisbee Association and the D.C. Shadow of Women's Professional Ultimate. Both teams play their regular season at roughly the same time, from April through June for the Shadow and into July for the Breeze. Both teams play at Carlini Field, which is located at Catholic University of America. Carlini is primarily used for college soccer and lacrosse, and then obviously for Ultimate Frisbee as well. Unfortunately, it's at the far north end of the Catholic University campus, and the metro station, Brookland CUA, is at the far south end of campus. So it's about a mile-long walk through campus to get to the field. Not ideal, but better than a lot of the alternatives, like where our rugby team plays, which I'll get to in a bit. Now, even though it's a professional sport, it's very different from all of the others that I've talked about so far. Most players are not full-time ultimate athletes. They have other jobs, and they play on the team in their extra time. If you watch YouTube, perhaps you know Marquez Brownlee, or MKBHD, who plays for the New York Empire. Obviously, his main job is not playing professional ultimate frisbee but he is technically a professional athlete. I've seen him play live, and he's really good, as are most of the players, to be honest. If you go to a professional ultimate game, it will definitely have the vibes of going to, like, a Division III college game or even a high school game. Carlini Field isn't very big. You'll be sitting on metal bleachers. But Ultimate Frisbee is actually a really fun spectator sport. Ultimate Frisbee is extremely family-friendly. Tickets are cheap, there's a lot of action so kids don't get bored, and sometimes they even let the kids come down from the stands during halftime to throw frisbees around or do other little competitions. It's a very casual sport, and if you haven't experienced it before and want to check it out, you definitely should. Now I said I would mention rugby, so let's go there next. Our professional rugby team is called Old Glory DC, and they are one of 12 teams in Major League Rugby. If you have cable, they sometimes play Major League Rugby games on Fox Sports 1 or Fox Sports 2, so you can watch a match or two and see what it's like. Unfortunately, despite having DC in the name, Old Glory plays at the Maryland Soccerplex in Germantown, Maryland. It is not a tourist-friendly location. In fact, it's not really in a location friendly to anyone other than folks who live up in this part of Maryland. The Washington Spirit played at the Soccerplex from 2013 to 2019, and honestly, it was a real shame because it was so hard to get up there that people just didn't go to games. When I go to Spirit games now, one of the things fans can bond over are the memories of when the games used to be up there and how awful that was. Anyway, for that reason, I have not personally been to an Old Glory game. There's really no way to get up there on the metro or public transportation. You have to drive. If you have a rental car or your own car, you could give it a try, though my general advice for DC tourists is to skip the rental car, so you probably won't have one. I wanted to include Old Glory in this episode because, just like the Spirit, perhaps there will come a day when they move to a more tourist-friendly venue, and it will be worth checking out a match. The next sport I want to briefly mention, even though I don't have much to say about it, is cricket. There is a startup league called Major League Cricket that just launched a year ago. Washington, D.C. has a team called the Washington Freedom. For the inaugural season, all teams in Major League Cricket played at a shared venue in Texas. I believe the longer-term plan is to build a cricket stadium at George Mason University, which is in Northern Virginia, but unfortunately, that's not particularly metro accessible, so we'll just have to wait and see how this all pans out. And I said I would cover college sports which to me are not professional sports. However, I am very much aware that for a lot of Americans, depending on where you live, the local Division I college teams are the de facto pro sports in your city or state. For the most part, 
College sports are not big in D.C. unless you're in college yourself. There are some Division I teams here, and the ones that have had the most success have generally been in basketball. For example, the Georgetown men's basketball team had their peak era back in the 1980s, winning the entire NCAA championship in 1984. The University of Maryland women's basketball team also had a quality era in the 2000s, including winning the NCAA championship in 2006. When it comes to football, the University of Maryland does participate in the Big Ten Conference, but compared to some of the other Big Ten teams, is less dominant and does not have the same following. I think if you look at the sports landscape, a lot of college teams with the biggest followings are geographically in places that don't have pro teams, and that's just simply not the case in D.C. Now before I get to the final segment of the episode, let me run through some frequently asked questions I think to applies to all sports or multiple sports rather than just a single one. First, what should you wear? The simple answer is, whatever you want. I've seen everything from people decked out in team gear with face paint to people wearing suits and ties coming just from work. As a tourist, you can wear whatever you would otherwise wear in D.C. as a tourist. That said, if you're going to an indoor sport like basketball or hockey, it will be in a climate-controlled environment and more likely on the cooler side than on the warmer side. Layers are often a good choice for indoor sports. For outdoor sports, you need to pay attention to the weather on the day you're planning to go, as the range of weather conditions in D.C. can be vast. For example, I went to the Washington Spirit game about one month ago on March 23rd. The temperature was listed at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but inside Audi Field, it felt like full-blown winter. I was wearing my winter coat, winter hat, and gloves, and it still felt cold. I've had similar experiences in the postseason when the Nationals were good, in the early spring and late fall, especially if the game you're attending is after dark, you have to expect it will feel colder than it might otherwise. On the flip side, in the summer months, particularly June, July, and August, you'll want to prepare for heat. I personally try, whenever I am the one choosing tickets, to pick a seat in the shade, especially for a day game. And again, I will leave a link to a resource for this in the show notes. Those are really the two keys. Dress comfortably and prepare for the temperature on a given game day. The next frequently asked question is, is it safe to root for the away team? The short answer to this is yes. American sports culture is different from sports culture, particularly soccer culture, in many other countries. For the most part, you can buy a seat anywhere in the stadium, wear an away jersey, and root for the away team. Now, my personal opinion on this matter is, if you're going to be an away fan, and I hold myself to this standard as well, you should treat it the same as being a guest in someone's home. Yes, you're allowed to be there. Yes, you can hold a different opinion from the host, but you can't be completely obnoxious about it. I feel like most away team fans are good about this, but I want to say it explicitly anyway. The next frequently asked question is, is it better to buy tickets online or at the venue? I personally think it's always better to buy tickets online in advance. We live in a digital age. Venues don't print paper tickets anymore. And just showing up at the venue, knowing exactly where I'm going to sit, is what I like. Most venues nowadays, even if they have a physical box office, still deliver your tickets to you electronically, so you still have to have an app to get in. A related question to this one is, is it safe to buy tickets on resale websites? I personally trust and use three ticketing sites, Ticketmaster, SeatGeek, and StubHub. There are many, many resale websites out there, and I'm sure some of them are okay, but I haven't really used any others, and I can't personally vouch for them. I do trust these three to deliver me real tickets, and they all have very clear guarantees that I feel like I can fall back on if necessary, though fortunately I've never had to. I know people don't like these companies because they charge not insignificant fees. I get it. It sucks. It's frustrating. Nobody wants to pay these companies more than they feel like they deserve. But at least I get the peace of mind knowing that everything I get is legit. Physical scalpers, like the guys who used to stand around outside the ballpark on game days, are kind of a relic of the past now. But I do know a lot of people are enticed by buying from someone on Facebook because the seller claims they can get them a better deal and save them on fees. Let me just say, if you're going to get scammed on tickets, the most likely place it's going to happen is Facebook. 
Sorry. I've seen these scammers in action on the Trip Hacks DC page. Sometimes I'll post about having a few tickets still available for an upcoming tour, and all of a sudden the comments are flooded by accounts that allegedly have tickets for sale that they want to unload because they can't make the tour. And I know these people don't have tickets because I know exactly who has a ticket for every single tour. Bottom line is, don't buy tickets on Facebook or anywhere else other than trusted websites. And one more frequently asked question is, how early should you arrive slash can we arrive late? The short answer is you can arrive whenever you want. If you arrive late, they'll let you in and you can catch whatever is left of the game. I do think this is an interesting question because I once had someone come on my tour who was visiting from another country and had attended the Nationals game the night before. And he asked me how much of a discount you get for arriving late. It didn't even occur to me that someone would think this way because where he was from, the sports culture is such that you never arrive late. You're always in your seat at kickoff time. So attending this baseball game and watching these people come in during the second or third, or later inning, he assumed there must be some financial benefit to it. Otherwise, why would you pay for a ticket for the whole game and then skip the beginning of it? Well, there's no benefit. People arrive late for all kinds of reasons. I personally think it's worth arriving one hour early anytime you're going to a new stadium or ballpark. To me, the game is only one part of the overall experience. And arriving early walking around and seeing what the stadium looks like and has to offer, getting some food, that's all worth doing. All right, so we've covered a lot in this episode, but it's not over yet. Stick around for my monthly update on what's new and happening here in D.C. And we're back. A few episodes ago, I started doing these end-of-episode updates to let you know about what's going on in the city and with Trip Hacks D.C., Let's start with the elephant in the room. Yes, this episode is one month late. No, I did not publish a podcast on April 1st, and it's not because I was playing an April Fool's joke. Spring break this year was extremely busy. Spring break in D.C. is always extremely busy, and things just got away from me a bit this year. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but Trip Hacks D.C. is basically a one-man operation. I have another tour guide, Christine, who leads the Monumental Trivia Tour, but otherwise, I do everything. I write these podcast episodes, record them, edit them, post them. I do the same for Trip Hacks DC videos, for social media. I handle the tour bookings, the accounting, the customer service. And of course, I lead over 100 tours year-round as well. There is no one else behind the scenes. It's just me. For whatever reason this year, I also got an overwhelming number of emails to the Trip Hacks DC website. I got a bunch of messages on Instagram. And whenever a message comes in, I put it in one of two buckets. Anyone who is asking about tours or wanting to book a tour goes in the first bucket, and I try to respond to them right away. Anyone who is asking for travel advice or general trip questions but does not indicate they have any interest in booking a tour goes into another bucket and I respond to those when I get a chance. Unfortunately, this year, I got so many of those, and I had so much else to do that a lot of them just never got a response. So if you emailed me about something other than tours and I never responded, I'm sorry. That's just how things went this year. I hope that the hundreds of videos and dozens of podcast episodes that I give away for free are enough to help most people plan out their trips, but I am just not able to provide individualized advice in any reliable way. My time is just stretched way too thin. Speaking of tours, a lot of people have been very curious about whether the Trip Hacks DC semi-private tour was successful. A quick recap, I launched this as a limited edition tour during spring break. There were four dates on the calendar and each tour was capped at a maximum of 10 tickets. I said I would declare this tour a success if it sold 24 or more total tickets. And I am happy to report it sold a total of 34 tickets in the end. So I am declaring it a success. And since it was successful, I am continuing it into the summer months. So the semi-private tour is now on the calendar for eight Saturdays this summer. All Saturdays in June and the first three Saturdays in July. So if this tour is one that you've had your eye on, Get your tickets as soon as you can because there are only 10 tickets available per tour, and if it sells out, that's it. 
I really enjoyed leading this tour this spring and meeting everyone who attended, and I do really feel like it's a quality tour. By the time this episode goes live, my private tour calendar will also be open through the end of August, and the monumental trivia tour with Christine will be bookable through the end of August as well. I sent out a notification to the people on my interest list last week, and a lot of private tours already got booked. So that's great for me, but for you, that means if you want to book a private tour and you haven't yet, don't wait too long. Just head on over to TripHacksDC.com, and you'll find everything there that you need. Thanks for listening to the Trip Hacks DC podcast. To see the show notes from today's episode, get additional resources for planning your trip, or to book a Trip Hacks DC guided tour, visit TripHacksDC.com.